So hello, everybody. My name is Miro Cupak. I'm a software developer at DNA Stack, where we've built a cloud platform for genomics. Uh, our platform is written primarily in Java, so we've started looking into what's new in Java 9, and I thought it would be interesting to share this information. So the goal of this talk is to go through a couple of my favorite APIs in Java 9. We're not going to talk about modularity or language improvements. I feel like that has been sufficiently covered elsewhere. Uh, what we're going to focus on are library APIs, and uh, particularly smaller APIs, APIs that don't get, get that much emphasis or that I think are underrated, or just APIs that make it easier for you to write cleaner code. So we're going to take a look at uh, three existing APIs. That's uh, the Collections API, Streams API, and Completable Future APIs, and the improvements that they got in the latest release of the Java platform, as well as three new APIs in the release, and that's the Stackwalker, Process Handle, and HTTP2 Client. And that's as far as I'm gonna go with slides. Uh, I feel like the smaller APIs are best explained using examples, so we're just gonna do a live demo. And we're going to write all the examples in JShell. Uh, and basically for each API, I would like to show how this was approached prior to Java 9, what APIs we had available then, and how this can be done better in Java 9. So I hope you can all see this. What you can see here is JShell, which is a tool. Oh, really? Yeah. Can we do something about the lights here? How's this? I'm not sure how, to be honest. Yeah, I think we're we're stuck with this. Is this readable? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So JShell is a tool bundled with the JDK, and uh, it's essentially Java's implementation of REPL, read develop print loop. So it's a tool that loops continuously, reads your input, evaluates it, prints out the output. So it's basically similar to common line interfaces that you're used to from other languages, such as Groovy. Scala, Python, they all had that before. And finally, Java is getting one as well. Uh, it's a really good tool for when you need to try something very quickly. Um, so it's good for prototyping, just exploring new APIs, or uh, learning the language if you're new to Java. The main thing that you need to know about JShell is that it accepts two types of inputs. Uh, there's snippets, so the actual Java code that you want to evaluate. And uh, there's commands to the actual JShell tool, which always start with a slash. And we're going to show a couple of these throughout this talk. But let's start with something really simple. I'm just going to do one plus one here. You can see two interesting things here. First of all, one plus one is two. Second of all, two was assigned to something called dollar one here. And dollar one is an implicit variable that JShell created for me. And it does that whenever you have an expression that you don't assign to anything. I could have, of course, created my own variable. I could have just, just done something like this. And this is a named variable x. And you've seen the first shortcut that I used here. Uh, JShell has a couple of these. Uh, shift tab and v infers a type of variable from the expression and then introduces a new variable of that type. I'm going to use this extensively throughout the talk. JShell also features standard tab completion that you're used to from other shells. So I can take advantage of this when I, let's say, print out my variable something like this. And that's two. So there's a couple of syntactic shortcuts as well. You oh. It's good? Great. Uh, yeah, so the syntactic shortcuts, you've noticed that I uh, didn't need to wrap my expression in anything. It's just one plus one, like this. I also need to didn't need to put a semicolon at the end of my statement. I wouldn't need to worry about catching checked exceptions and a couple of things like that. So this brings us to the first command, and that's varse, which simply lists all the variables that I've declared. Similarly to this, I can type methods and classes in JShell, and there's the respective commands for that, methods or types, but of course, I don't have anything here at this point. There's also list that lists all my snippets. 
And JShell has this prefix matching going on. So as long as you specify a unique prefix of a command, it can actually find the command and execute it. So I could have done just something like this. And the last command here is command help. That just gives you information about everything else that you can do within JShell. And that's pretty much all that you need to know. JShell as a tool is extremely easy to figure out. So let's move on to the first API. Um, the first on the list are convenience factory methods for collections. And Java 9 makes it really easy to create immutable collections of small sizes. This is something that was relatively tedious to do prior to Java 9. And I'm sure everybody knows the drill. If I wanted to create a set, for example, I would have to do something like this. Let's say a set of string. And let's call it a set. Then I would add a couple of elements. Let's say like this. And then to make it immutable, I would wrap it in an unmodifiable set. Like this. And there are a couple of issues with this approach. First of all, it's pretty verbose. So if you have static variables, you need to do a static initializer block. That's not really convenient. There's also performance overhead. Um, this is not really an immutable collection. It's more like an immutable view of an existing collection. So if I kept the reference to the original set, I would still be able to modify it. And there's performance overhead associated with supporting mutability, not to mention all the extra objects that I had to create in the process just to get to the immutable collection. But that's much easier in Java 9. Java 9 has static factory methods on all the main interfaces, uh, list, set, and map. And I can easily create a collection like this. It's overall with a bunch of times, 12 to be exact. So it's always uh, 0 to 10 arguments, and then the last one is var arcs. And the reason it's done this way, it's uh, because there's performance overhead associated with creating the array to back up the var arc. So if you're creating reasonably small collections, which presumably is going to satisfy vast majority of use cases, you want to avoid this penalty. So I can create a list just easily like this. Let's call this a list. And then if I try to add something to this list, you can see that it really is immutable. It's going to throw an exception. Similarly, if I try to get the class, it's going to tell me that it's something immutable. But an interesting thing to note here is um, these immutable classes are not really a part of the public API. So we can only rely on the interface here. And similarly, the factory methods are methods on the interface. So they're not inherited. You cannot invoke them through an implementing class. So this is pretty much the only way to create this list. And that's just a nice design pattern to point out. So for a set, it's uh, pretty much the same thing. For a map, it's a bit different, though. For a map, we have 11 methods here. So it's always 0 to 10 elements, or in this case, 20, because you always specify key and value interchangeably. There's no var arg version of this method. And that's because keys and values can have different types, and you cannot have two var arg arguments in the same method. So what they've done with this is actually create a separate method which takes just one var arc of map entries. So if I wanted to take advantage of this, I could just create a map doing something like this. And I have a map where key is an integer and value is a string. And that's pretty much all there is uh, to know about uh, these factory methods. So it's just a really nice convenience feature. Collections play very nicely with the Streams API, which was introduced in Java 8. And Streams learned a couple of new tricks in Java 9 as well. So the first feature that I would like to talk about here is uh, job while and take while methods. So let's just, let's just go back uh, and have a look at what we could do in Java 8. We could create a stream of ints, something like this. Let's say 0 to 9, and then just print it. I'm just going to use a quick uh, method reference here. And I have numbers 0 to 9. What I also had available in Java 8 were methods limit and skip. So I could do something like this, limit 5, which gives me the first five elements of the stream. And the complementary method, skip, gives me the rest of the stream. So that was good. But the problem with this was that in certain situations, you don't know this number beforehand. You just know that you want to keep taking elements while a certain condition is met. And that at some point, you have enough. But there wasn't really an easy way to express this in Java 8. In Java 9, however, we have take while and drop while methods. So I can specify something like this. Let's say x is uh, less than 5. And the complementary operation, 
job while. So these are kind of like versions of limited escape that take a predicate instead of a fixed value. And it's just really nice to have this here. Another new method here is the method iterate. And let's take a look at it. You can see that there are two versions of this method. Uh, the first one was available in Java 8. The second one was added in Java 9. And the difference is the predicate here. So let's take an example. Let's say, let's say I want to list all the even numbers that are less than 100. Now, a very naive approach to do this in Java 8 would be to do something like this. I'm going to iterate from 0. Let's increment by, one, by 2. And then I'm going to print all of these. And the method reference here, just like this. And you can see that it kind of worked, but not really, because I forgot to filter. So I would filter this, let's say, I think I said 100. And I can do this. And this almost works. And the reason this doesn't work, even though it seems like a very simple example, is that I did filter the first 100 elements here, but I created an infinite stream. So after a while, the stream kept going, and at some point it went over, and suddenly all my integers were less than 100. And there wasn't really a good way of ex expressing this boundary condition in Java 8, but in Java 9, we can actually easily do this. I'm just going to remove the filter here. I can add another condition here, something like this. This is going to work correctly. So if you look at it, it reads essentially like a four cycle, and that's basically what it is. It's like a streamified version of four. So just a really, really nice handy feature here. Now, the last method that I wanted to mention here is a method of nullable. So in Java 8, I could create streams of certain specific elements using a factory method. I could do something like this, which would give me a stream containing a single element, and an element is one. What I couldn't do is something like this which makes sense, because you don't want to have nullists in your streams. However, in Java 9, I can do off nullable, pass null, and it actually gives me a stream. And if I have a look at it and call the method count, it tells me that it's actually an empty stream. So Java 9 is smart enough to treat null as kind of an empty stream. So where is that useful? It basically makes integration better. So if you're writing long streams, and you have a couple of chained operations, especially maps, at some point, you're going to end up with nulls. And you will need to filter these out, because you don't want to have them in your streams. You don't want to have null pointer exceptions. So at some point, you will have a block with an if statement or a ternary operator that gets rid uh, of these nulls. And that's just not really nice code to have. So this allows you to get rid of those null checks. Uh, just a nice convenience feature there. Another API that plays really nicely with streams is the completable future API. Completable futures um, basically provide framework for asynchronous programming in Java. They were introduced uh, in Java 8. And they're kind of built around the class called completable future. And as the name would suggest, this is essentially a future that can be explicitly completed. So what this is used for is you typically use this to model tasks, particularly asynchronous tasks, in a bigger computation that consists of many tasks. So you can change the status and the value of the future, and you also have APIs for creating dependencies between futures. So you can express things like, OK, when this future is done, trigger this action. So let's just have a look at uh, the really basic functionality here. You can create a new future. Let's say future of string. And let's call it CF. Then I can complete the future with a value in my case a string. And you can see that now the future is completed normally. And if I try to extract the value, it's actually going to give me that value. So what happens if I don't complete the future? Let's reinitialize this here. And I'm just going to call the get method directly. And you can see that in this case, it just keeps blocking. And it's essentially waiting for somebody else to complete the future from a different thread. And that's basically how you synchronize using this construct. You can also complete the future exceptionally, which allows you to give it uh, a throwable. In this case, I'm just going to pass an illegal state exception, for example. And now, if I try to obtain the value of the future, it's actually going to fail with that exception that I gave it. 
So that's kind of the basic functionality around completable futures. Java 9 introduced a bunch of things, uh, quite a few actually. Uh, completable future is a pretty big class, almost 3,000 lines of code, and it has a bunch of methods and a bunch of public methods as well. And quite a few of these were added in Java 9. Uh, most of them are not very exciting. It's mostly stuff like utility methods, factory methods, uh, methods that make it easier for you to subclass completable future and stuff like that. There are three, however, that I'm really excited about. And Java 9 basically provided a new way of completing futures based on a timeout. So in Java 9, I can do something, something like this. Let's uh, reinitialize this here and can call complete on timeout, which takes a value, timed out, and then the actual time. So let's say I'm going to give it five seconds. So now, if I have a look at this future, not completed yet, still not completed, and now it completed normally, and the value is actually timed out. So uh, this is really useful when you have sort of distributed computation. Let's say you have a computation that involves uh, talking to several microservices, and for each one of those you want to express something like, okay, wait for this result from this microservice for five seconds. If it completes, that's fine. If it doesn't complete, I'm going to load the default value or load the value from cache or something like that. You can also fail a future if something doesn't complete in time. I'm just going to reinitialize this here. That's accomplished through the method or timeout, which just takes time. So I'll give it five seconds again. And now if I try to get the value, it's going to wait for five seconds and then it's going to fail with a timeout exception. So these are sort of two methods that allow you to express time dependencies. Um, the final method that I wanted to talk about here is the method copy. And copy essentially allows you to create a defensive copy of a future. So this is really useful when you're designing asynchronous APIs where you're actually returning completable futures. You want the clients to be able to take these futures and respond to the changes in these futures, but you don't want them to be able to write back. You don't want them to be able to complete the future that you're using internally. And that's what copy does. So it's kind of like a one-way synchronization. And let's take a look at this. Let's reinitialize this here. And I'm going to create a copy. Let's call it a copy. And then you can see that uh, none of them is completed yet. Obviously, if I complete the original, the original is completed now, and the copy is completed as well. So the change was propagated for the client to react. So what happens if I do it the other way around? Let's reinitialize CF, reinitialize the copy, and now I'm going to complete the copy here. And copy is done, the original didn't change. So it's like a one-way synchronization thing. And that's, uh, that's a really nice feature to have. So I think it's going to be really useful. So I think that's enough about uh, these tiny additions to existing APIs. Let's have a look at some new APIs in Java 9. And the first one on the list is Stackwalker. Stackwalker gives us easy, lazy, and stream-friendly access to stack traces. So prior to Java 9, I could do something like this. I could have a throwable and call the get stack trace method. And this gives me an array of stack trace elements. So if I print this here, this is my stack trace at this point in time. Uh, there are a few issues with this. Uh, issue number one, this is pretty expensive. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I only need the first few frames uh, or the first few elements of the stack trace. The JVM always need to, needs to eagerly capture the whole stack. Uh, there are also no convenience methods. I cannot easily filter things out. I can't easily get access to the actual class instances of the classes that declare the methods. And on top of that, I cannot even rely on this stack trace to be complete. The specification says that JVM can omit certain elements if it helps performance. Thankfully, all these disadvantages are addressed in Java 9 through a class called Stackwalker. So Stackwalker is actually pretty easy to use. You can just obtain an instance here. And the main method here is walk that allows me to access stack traces as streams. So I can do something like this. I can collect this stream and just use collectors to a list. 
and this gives me the full stack trace, very similar to the one that we got from the get stack trace method. However, in this case, I can take advantage of all the stream operations. So if I was only interested in stack trace of depth three, for example, I could just do limit three. And this just gives me the top three elements of the stack. I can also easily get access to, to the class instances. I can just tell the stack driver to uh, retain the references. And then I'm just going to remove this limit here. I'm going to use a map to extract this information. So I'll do for each frame, give me the declaring class. And these are all the classes involved in my stack trace. Uh, so it's really nice. It's, it's a great convenience API to have in Java. Another API that I'm really excited about, and I think that's actually probably the most underrated feature in Java 9 for me personally, is the process handle API. So the new process handle API allows me to easily get information about processes. So what we had available in Java prior to Java 9, since Java 1.5 actually, was the process builder API that made it really easy to launch external processes. So I could do something like this. Process builder, and I forgot to close this. Command, let's say I want to list all the Java processes in my system. It's going to do JPS start, and this starts an external process, JPS. Now, the main limitation of this API is that I cannot get any information about the process, even really simple things such as the PID. That's available in Java 9, but it wasn't easy to access before this. Uh, so what people ended up doing is either using JMX, which is really hacky, or they would write their own tools. So typically, you would call something like a PS and grab, and you would essentially obtain information about the process from the outside which is just really unnecessary, tedious to write, uh, not to mention all the portability issues. So it's really great to see this finally resolved as part of the JDK. So JDK 9 provides an interface called Process Handle, which allows me to get all sorts of information uh, about the actual process. So I can obtain a handle to my current process, and there I can easily extract uh, the PID, just like this. Uh, I can also get access to all sorts of other information through the info interface. You can see this gives me quite a few things. And there's kind of convenience methods for everything. So I think one that's going to be used pretty frequently uh, is command line, which essentially tells you how your Java application was launched. So it's the full, full Java command, all the arguments and everything. So that's pretty useful. You can also get information about other processes in your system. So I can do, uh, can do something like process handle all processes, which gives me a stream. And then I can extract some information from this. Let's say for each process, give me info and then the command. And then I'm just going to collect this. And this gives me all the commands running in my system. Another really useful part of, of this API that's new in Java 9 is method on exit, which allows you to essentially trigger an action when an external process completes. And that's, uh, that's really useful. So let's try something here. I'm just going to create a process that has predictable runtime. So let's call, let's call sleep, for example. I'm going to tell it to sleep for three seconds, and I can just start the process and immediately obtain the handle to it. And then I can call the method on exit, which gives me the completable future. And we've seen the API for completable futures. I can easily just do something like then accept, and there I will just print. Uh, I can just print the whole process handle, actually. So the two string there essentially prints the PID. So just to recap, what I'm expecting to happen here is a process starts asynchronously, and then three seconds later, I'm going to see the PID of the now deceased process. So let's try this here. Process started, and now I can see the PID. So that's really useful. And I also don't need to limit myself to managing individual processes. Uh, I can build the whole pipelines uh, in the sense of Unix pipelines, so I can express things like take the output of this first process and connect it to the input of the next process. Let's just demonstrate this really quickly. Uh, let's say I'm going to list 
all my Java processes and then grab for J shell, which obviously should be running at this point. So I can just create a process builder here and use my favorite JPS. And I'm going to, to call it JPS. And then I will just call, call a grab for J shell. And let's call this grab. And then I can just start this as a pipeline. So I'll just do start pipeline. And you can see that this takes a list of process builders. So I can take advantage of the convenience factory methods here. I'm just going to do a list of JPS and grab. And so let's call this pipeline. So now this is started asynchronously. Um, if I try to access it now, it should be finished. And you can see that everything finished correctly with the zero return value. So now let's try and take a look at what I actually ended up processing. Um, so I'm going to take the pipeline here and get access to the last process in the list, which is index one. And then I will obtain an input stream uh, to the output of the process. And I need to do the whole Java boilerplate uh, loop here. So I'll just wrap this in an input stream reader. Uh, and I made a typo like this, and then wrap this in a buffered reader. And then finally, I can use the method read line. Uh, is there a typo anywhere? Oh, here. Yeah, thank you. And I can see that it found the process with this PID that's called JShell Tool Provider, which is the actual process that runs JShell. So that's very nice. And you can see how this is a really powerful API. And it's something that you wouldn't want to implement yourself, uh, especially in a way that works on all the different platforms. So it's uh, really great to see this as part of the JDK. Now, uh, the last feature that I wanted to talk about here is uh, the new HTTP2 client. And Yeah, lots of questions at the end. Thanks. Uh, so the new HTTP client uh, not only provides a much cleaner API than the old HTTP URL connection, but it also supports all the cool new things. It supports HTTP2, WebSockets, TLS, and everything that you would expect, server push, cookies, proxies, uh, asynchronous requests, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the new HTTP client API is delivered as an incubator module in Java 9 which means that it's not completely finalized and it's not resolved by default and it lives in a special namespace, but I pre-imported here into JShell so that we can play around with it. Now, to demonstrate the client functionality, I'm going to need a server. And if there's anything that we've learned from previous demos at this conference, it's that you cannot rely on the internet here. So I'm just going to write a really quick one here in Java. And I actually really like this example because I think this is something that people usually consider hard to do, or they assume that it's going to require a lot of code in Java. But actually, you can create a very simple server very easily just using functionality provided in the JDK. And it's old API that has been around for a very long time. So I will just create the simplest possible server. There's going to be one endpoint that just returns uh, a fixed string. So let's start by creating an HTTP handler for this endpoint. Uh, I'm going to call it a handler that's going to take an HTTP exchange uh, as a quick lambda here. So I'll define the string that I want to use. Let's call it body. It's going to be hello Java 1. And now I will set the response headers. I'm always going to respond with 200. Everything is okay. I'm going to attach the length of my string here. And finally, I will write the string to the output. So I will open an output stream here. Uh, let's assign the response body here. And too many brackets. No, this looks fine. And there I will just write to this output stream. And I have to do this through get bytes because it's an old API, but that's okay for demo purposes. And now I'll just close everything. Great. So if you take a look here, this is our new handler looks okay, so we can go on and try to start a server. 
So I'm going to create a server here and this takes a port. So I will give it, let's say 8,000 and don't need a backlog. Let's call this HS and then I will create the endpoint. Let's say slash hello and I will attach my favorite handler to this. And now finally I can start the server. So hopefully the server is running and to test this, let's use uh, the old HTTP URL connection API uh, just to see how, uh, how ugly it was and how, how good the new client looks in comparison. So I'll start by defining a URI here. It's going to point to my local server. So it's HTTP localhost uh, 8000 slash hello. And let's call this a URI. And I will convert this to a URL so that I can open a connection here. And this actually returns a URL connection, which is no good. I actually want HTTP URL connection. And this whole API was designed with multiple protocols in mind, even though HTTP is realistically the only one that you would use. So unfortunately, I need to cast this here. So I'm just going to do HTTP URL connection, and let's call it C. So you can see that I'm just starting out and this API is already really ugly. Now I can specify the request method. It's just going to be a simple get. And this needs to be passed as, passed as a string. Again, not really nice. And now let's test if this works. So we'll do get response code. And I can see that it's 200. That looks promising. So let's try and read the actual output. And again, I will need to do the standard Java boilerplate stuff. I will open, I will get the input stream uh, from my connection, wrap this in an input stream reader, wrap this in a buffered reader, a lot of boilerplate here, and I can finally read the line. And it says, hello, Java 1. So that's great. Now let's try to do this with the new HTTP2 client. So the, the new API is kind of built around three main classes. There's HTTP client, HTTP request, and HTTP response, pretty self-explanatory. So we'll just start by creating the client here, new HTTP client, and let's call this a client. Then I will construct the request, which uh, uses a builder pattern here. So I'll just obtain the builder, give it the URI that I had from before, uh, specify the get method as a method, this is really nice, and then build it, let's call this a request, and then I can finally send the request uh, to my server. So this takes a request and something called uh, body handler here, and I just want to tell it in this case to treat everything as a string, and thankfully there's a built-in handler for this. So I will just do body handler a string. And let's call this response. And now I can easily obtain information from this response. I can just do response status code 200 response body hello java one. It's just really nice, really clean. And it's really flexible as well. If I wanted to make this asynchronous, all that I need to do is change this, send a sync, and this would return a completable future here. Actually, let's just use this. Uh, wait, uh, okay, one more time. Let's call this a response and yeah, that looks good actually. And now this gives me complete little future. We've seen this API before. So I can just call it get and then body. And here it is, asynchronous, hello, child one. So that's uh, really nice. They also have really nice handling around TLS that goes way beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, you can do all sorts of things like managing uh, certificates and all that in a very nice way. And that's basically it. That's the overview of my favorite APIs in Java 9. So I hope uh, you found this interesting. Before we go, since I don't have any slides, I will just save this session, save the history of this session to a file. Uh, let's say backup.
Jay Shell, and I can post this to Twitter later if you want to come back to some of these examples. And that's pretty much it. So we're uh, close to running out of time, but we have some time for questions, but regardless, I'll be around until the next talk starts. So thank you and enjoy the rest of Java 1.